Okay. <clears throat> dear Professor Morgenthaler, dear uh, friends and colleagues, uh, welcome to the uh, the lecture and tribuna of uh, the Forum of Institute of European Studies. Uh, today, I have really very great pleasure. Aber ich muss erst in etwas sagen in Deutsch. Das ist wirklich Privilegie, dass wir kennen mit uns willkommen Professor Gerd Morgenthaler. Und wir sind sehr glücklich, dass er sehr interessante Wissenschaftler, aber auch sehr gut intellektuell und Mann ist. Uh, and so much I will, uh, I just wanted a uh, little bit to, to greet our really, really interesting guest. Uh, we had the pleasure yesterday to spend the whole day uh, on a road, <laughs> let me quote the Kerouac, and to be in Novi Sad, who, which is very interesting for himself. Uh, and we had a fantastic uh, seminar, I could say a lecture and seminar after that in Matica Srpska. Uh, and I would like to, to thank to our, um, our host there, Professor Stanić and people from Matica Srpska and uh, other colleagues like Professor Baner Istivojevic were with us. Our colleague uh, uh, Petar Čurčić was also there. So it was very, very nice yesterday. And today we have the, the second day, second working day of his visit, actually. Uh, I think that he's very satisfied with the uh, time he spent with uh, with uh, Peter as a good uh, tourist guide as well. They had a chance to to, to visit uh, uh, San Sava uh, Cathedral or Temple and uh, some other stuff, including the law faculty in Belgrade, uh, uh, Tash Maidan, uh, Russian church with Wrangel there and so on and so on. So anyway, today uh, we are what I would say is the culmination or the peak of his visit uh, uh, as we intended to, to organize here. And before I pass the floor to Professor Morgenthaler, I will try to present uh, uh, his uh, uh, history in a way and uh, his work. Uh, and this is really very impressive um, uh, achievements, uh, publications and work that he have done, uh, which is making him more than legitimate and interesting for the, um, uh, interesting for, uh, the subject we're going to deal with today. Actually, I will start with, first with his family. Uh, issue, which is also why I mentioned yesterday, uh, his uh, family, he was born in, in uh, Germany and lives there and so on. But his family spent something like 170 years in the space around uh, Novi Sad or Novi Sad. Uh, actually, uh, uh, he, his uh, uh, ancestors came in 1783, we yesterday mentioned, and mostly living in the uh, spaces like Kach, uh, Budisava, Bachki Yarak, and so on. And they uh, left, um, his mother was having five years actually, when uh, they left after the Second World War. And since that time, they were living in Bavaria, Heidelberg, uh, and so on and so on. So actually he came for the first time to, uh, uh, together with his mother uh, four years ago and had very nice experience, as he told us, uh, in visiting those places for mother. That was really substantial experience. They uh, visited Belgrade, uh, monasteries like Rushedol, probably, and so on. And we made very nice contact uh, last year when I had the chance to, to participate at the seminar organized by our friend uh, Max Sote. We made very nice connection. He told me what he's been doing. And I, of course, used the opportunity to invite him, which he was uh, more than uh, uh, willing to accept. And that's how we got him. Uh, he will maybe speak more about afterwards uh, about that issue. But I just wanted to say that for him, even emotionally, it was very interesting to visit yesterday Matica Srpska, Novi Sad, and to have the lecture there. Anyway, he's, uh, 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 we just uh, spoke about some of the most important things in his life concerning career. He uh, was studying uh, law uh, in Heidelberg, where he uh, uh, defended his PhD in 1991. Uh, this was dealing with international taxation, international taxation law. 
and uh, in 99 uh, also at Heidelberg he did his habilitation uh, the fact that is very important for our today's lecture he was working with professor Paul Kirchhoff who was at that time uh, uh, judge of the uh, Karlsruhe uh, Constitutional Court and actually the person who was in charge for writing the explanation uh, of the, um, the, the, the indictment or let me say the um, uh, verdict uh, uh, of the Karlsruhe Constitutional Court dealing with European and Maastricht issue. So actually he had the chance, this is very important for us, that already in 95 and 96 he had the chance to work on that to, he knows uh, uh, the work of uh, uh, constitutional court from inside so i think that he will give us quite a nice uh, view from inside uh, so uh, he is working as a professor of public law at university of Siegen, dealing uh, actually in a way he has two um, uh, as, as you may guess from what I've already said, uh, constitutional law is, is very important for him, but taxation law on which he was working practically and theoretically also, and so on. Uh, the other very important stuff is actually that uh, well, already for eight years, I think, seven, eight years, he is involved in a very interesting achievement together with Max Sote and the historian, Belgian historian, uh, David Engels. Uh, they are leading uh, 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 Oswald Spengler uh, Society, which is based in Belgium. And for the time, uh, they have organized uh, four, I think, biannual conferences. And uh, this is very interesting achievement because they also uh, not only paying attention to the heritage of Oswald Spengler and uh, doing researches about him and so on, but they are also uh, having the institutional biannual prize. Uh, also Spengler Prize and some of the people who have won that are for example Michel Houellebecq uh, the famous French writer and um, uh, 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 Jordan Peterson very famous uh, Canadian uh, uh, philosopher activist psychologist and so on I had the chance to show you one of those publications of the journal, journal of the Oswald Spengler Society this is from uh, uh, 2019, and this was edited by Michel Welbeck, David Engels, Greg, Mor uh, Greg uh, Ger Morgenthaler, and Max Sote. Actually, this is their product as well. So, um, I and I will finish with just mentioning the basic publication, uh, Freiheit du Gazette, uh, and this is the issue that's very important for general researchers and the public attitude of uh, our today's guest, and this is the freedom through law, and actually he's very much insisting on general defense uh, in, in a good classical German tradition going from uh, Kant and Hegel, that actually the freedom uh, should be based uh, on uh, law and importance of the legal defense of the pre freedom. Then I will mention Umweltrecht uh, from 2007. This is the book about, uh, let me say, ecological right, if I could say, the ecological law. Uh, e, uh, and uh, uh, the, le the license Gebühren im System des in Internationalen Einkommen Steuer Recht from uh, 92. This is, let me try to uh, uh, translate uh, royalties in the system of international uh, fiscal uh, or taxation income law, if I'm right, more or less dissertation, dissertation that was published in 92 as a, as a book as well. So I uh, j gave the, the, a lot of things that I learned from him that are very interesting and so on. And my internal, pre uh, sorry, introductory presentation will be finished by, let me say, small uh, Geschenk uh, uh, or donation, uh, let me joke a little bit, uh, from the Institute to the Oslo Spengler Society. Uh, we found uh, the last edition of uh, uh, Decline of the West or uh, Untergang des Abelands, uh, which was translated in 1936. We were praising ourselves from Vladimir Vujic, and this is exactly this uh, translation that is published. I think this is the third edition from 2018, published by Slushbeni Glasnik. So I will give that as a present from the Institute. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah. 
thank you very, very much, Misha, for these very friendly words. Uh, and hello to all you colleagues. Uh, I'm very, very happy to be here. And um, as Misha mentioned, uh, my family comes from the area. It comes from the Novi Sad area. And uh, whenever I come here, it's the second time now, I feel somehow at home here. It's a very pleasant surroundings, very friendly people. And it is now topped. Everything has been topped by the friendship with Misha. Uh, we understood each other spontaneously when we met in the Eiffel in um, last year in this uh, small conference workshop. Um, and uh, he, he invited me very friendly and I spontaneously said, yes, we must do this. And it worked very quickly. Thank you very much for that. Um, I do not want to say too much in advance before I start with my presentation. I was asked to talk on the uh, conflict between the courts in, um, in Karlsruhe, the German constitutional court, federal constitutional court, and the court of the European Union. Um, in the following, I will just say the, the, the German court and the European court, in short. Um, and um, I experienced this conflict. Uh, as, he, as you said, I, I, I observed the development of the European Union right from the beginning, so to say from inside. Um, I, I, try, uh, I helped to prepare uh, the uh, ruling on the Maastricht decision, which was in 1995, I think I would have to look it up, but uh, it's the famous decision, the first decision made by the, Euro by the German Federal Constitutional Court on these European Union questions, including the question of the monetary union, the introduction of the euro. And then I always followed, of course, the, the uh, development, and um, um, I will now try to sum up uh, some of the uh, basic facts. I thought, I, I, I considered how to present it and I mm, thought it would be best just to repeat what happened uh, up to now between these two courts. And I suggest that we then discuss the questions that are most interesting for you because uh, we could talk about that for hours or for days. Uh, I will just try to line out the basics and I'll then be happy to get into a discussion with you about these questions. Yeah. So let me start. Uh, the European Union is an international organization with a very special character. Uh, its primary and secondary law claims absolute priority over the laws of the member states, as you know, including the constitutions. Uh, what's more, the Court of Justice of the European Union has the exclusive power to authoritatively interpret the European Union's law. These principles have largely been accepted for decades in the interest of a uniform interpretation and application of the European Union's law in all the member states, uniformity. You know? uh, nevertheless, the dogmatical foundations of these principles were never really clear, given the fact that the European Union is, at least originally, an international organization, and the members are sovereign states. Yeah? Sovereign states, but they are subjected to the legislation of the European Union and to the court of the European Union. As you clearly know, as you certainly know, there has recently been a dispute between the Constitutional Court of the Federal Republic of Germany and the Court of Justice of the European Union over exactly these questions. A dispute that is not only highly political, but also urges us to discuss and reconsider the legal nature of the European Union in the context of some of the most fundamental concepts of public law, like statehood and sovereignty. In my following presentation, I will outline the recent dispute between the two courts with an emphasis on the German constitutional courts approach. On this basis, we can then discuss the legal and political implications of this dispute. When we consider the relationship between European law, Union law and domestic law from the perspective of the German constitution, 
we must distinguish two important questions. And I will also uh, follow these two steps. Yeah? First, there is the question of the conferral of sovereign powers to the European Union by the German state in the process of concluding the European treaties. And secondly, there is the question of the acting of European institutions and national organs or authorities under the given treaties. These are two different uh, questions, and I will distinguish in the following. In both cases, the possibility of a breach of the national constitution can arise. And therefore, the German constitutional court is called up to react somehow. Let me start with the first point, the conferral of sovereign powers to the European Union. And to talk first about the constitutional framework in Germany. The basis of this is Article 23 of the German basic law, the Grundgesetz. In Germany, the standards regulating the conferral of sovereign powers to the European Union are set out in Article 23, mainly in its paragraph one of the constitution. This provision states the following rules. I only mentioned the most important points. First, the Federal Republic of Germany should cooperate in the development of a European Union, which respects democratic, social, federal, and some other principles, and guarantees a minimum protection of fundamental rights. Germany may confer sovereign powers for the sole purpose of developing exactly this kind of European Union. The European Union must be democratic, etc. Et Second, the establishment of the European Union, as well as changes to the treaties by which the basic law, our constitution, is supplemented in its content, should be considered amendments in the German constitution. So whenever German institutions, the parliament confers sovereign rights to the European Union, this entails a, a change to our own constitution. This is said in Article 23. Therefore, the law agreeing to the conferral of sovereign powers requires a qualified majority in parliament. Yeah, we have to, a two thirds majority in parliament uh, is necessary. Um, with this rule, the basic law acknowledges the fact that the conferral of sovereign powers leads to a fundamental change in the national constitutional order. The third point of this provision 23 is some modifications are inadmissible because we have the rule in Article 79 of our Constitution that some changes to our Constitution, some amendments are inadmissible, are not possible. These are the uh, amendments that would change the democratic structure, etc., some other principles of our Constitution, which, which is not allowed, never, not even with an unanimous decision of Parliament. And this close clause of Article 79, which is also valid in, in the framework of the conferral of sovereign power, um, contains or refers to certain unchangeable elements that represent the constitutional essence and give the German basic law its identity. The identity may not be changed. Among these unchangeable elements is the fundamental provision contained in Article 20 of the basic law, which says that the Federal Republic of Germany is a state. This guarantee makes it clear that from the German constitutional perspective, the emerging European Union is not intended to be a state and must not intended to be a state. It can only be what the federal constitutional court called a Staatenverbund, a German term, which we did not know before, <laughs> they coined it new, in order to express that it is not a Staat, not a state, and not a Staatenbund. This means an international organization. It's something in between, something new. And as this is a new expression, Staatenverbund, I cannot translate it into English. How should I translate a, a, a term that did not exist into another language where it isn't, doesn't exist too? But in the following, to make it easier, I will call it a union of states. Yeah? This is just a definition for this lecture here. Union of states is the translation of Staatenverbund, which is a new term 
with which we do not know what to do. Yeah? <laughs> By referring to the obligation to participate in the democratic development of the European Union, you remember Article 23, the Constitutional Court pointed out that within such a union of states, Staatenverbund, the continuity of legitimacy and influence originating from the national people, from the German people in our case, must be maintained. There must be a legitimation going from the German parliament to the European Union, and this must be maintained. It may not be cut off, yeah, this string of uh, legitimacy. This is in full accord with Article 1, by the way, of the, treaty on, of the Treaty on European Union, which speaks of, I quote, a union among the peoples of Europe. The European Treaty does not speak of a European nation or a European treaty, but it speaks of a union of the peoples, plural, of Europe. This union primarily receives the right to exercise power from the citizens of the member states who are democratically represented by their national parliaments. No doubt in this process of integration, this is what the, European, uh, the German court says, no doubt in the process of this integration, the European Union can increasingly derive its democratic legitimacy from its own institutional structure too mainly from the European Parliament, the main representative organ of the nations in the European Union. Again, according to the treaties, the European Parliament is not the representation of the, of the European nation, of, which does not exist according to the treaties, but of the nations in plural in Europe. Consequently, while the German Constitutional Court considered is, considers it fundamental, that the democratic foundations of the European Union must be gradually strengthened. It also emphasizes the point that a true democracy must be maintained in the member states. Yeah, it must not be given up, uh, democracy uh, in the member states. And this will become important in the following. Now, when the Federal Constitutional Court, the German court, uh, supervises the conferral of sovereign powers to the European Union, we will have to consider or draw the following consequences from what I said before. Any national law transferring sovereign powers to the European Union can be supervised by the Federal Constitutional Court under several procedural provisions. In this context, it is important that, or of particular importance, that the court has recognized individual constitutional complaints under Article 93 of our Constitution as a control instrument. What does this mean? That every individual, every German national can sue um, the parliament, the national parliament, when it confers national power, sovereign power to the European Union contra the Constitution. Yeah? When it does something that the Constitution does not permit, there is an individual right of every German national citizen, of every citizen, to sue the Parliament before the Constitutional Court. This was very disputed. Yeah? It is a, an interesting uh, uh, construction, but it is the only safeguard for citizens uh, if the uh, if the state organs do not. Um, do not do their job, let me say it, <laughs> simply. Um, so uh, this is important, an important pro procedural question. And in the material, in the substantial sense, if a control measure is admitted by the Constitutional Court, it, the court, examines whether laws authorizing changes to the EU treaties comply with the principles set out in the basic law. These criteria include the general conditions contained in Article 23, which I mentioned initially, and also special conditions referred to in other articles of the Constitution. For example, in Article 88, which refers to the European Central Bank. We will also come back to this. So we have a general provision, Article 23, which says Germany must uh, participate in the process of European integration, but the goal must be a democratic, uh, etc., uh, European Union. This can be controlled. 
And there are special conditions like if there is a common currency, Article 88, if there is a common currency, uh, then the European Central Bank must be independent. This is Article 88. And the, European, and the German court checks these conditions. <laughs> the Constitutional Court places particular emphasis on the precondition according to which acts conferring sovereign powers may not give the European Union power to determine its own competences. In other words, the European Union has no competence competence because otherwise it would be sovereign. It must not be sovereign. This is the initial st thing. Germany is and has to endure being a state. And uh, this means the European Union may not become a state. And this also leads to the conclusion that it must never get a competence competence from the German point of view. When the Treaty of Lisbon, later after the Treaty of Maastricht, introduced the simplified possibility of amending the treaties on the, fun the treaty on the functioning of the European Union without a national ratification procedure, the so-called passerelle procedure in Article 48, the court, the German court, felt obliged to stress the fact that the German federal government and parliament have a special responsibility for integration. This means they must ensure that the establishment of European decision-making processes meet the constitutional obligation to preserve the democratic nature of the European Union. Now, these uh, uh, standards have been established in the context of the introduction of the European Union, uh, and at the same time, the, this was the introduction of the Monetary Union in 1992. Um, and these questions also became, or over and over again, became um, relevant in the context of further steps within the Monetary Union. So I will now refer to the Monetary Union. Um, I can impossibly explain the architecture of the uh, European Union, although this would be very interesting and necessary to fully understand uh, the background of the next of the things that are to come now. I will only try to outline in very short uh, the construction of the European Monetary Union. If you're interested, we can discuss this later. Let me outline it. In its judgment on the Maastricht Treaty, this was uh, in 1995 or so, the Federal Constitutional Court examined the general concept of the monetary union, underlining that seen from the German constitutional context, it could only be accepted, the union, the monetary union could only be accepted because it was organized as a community of stability a Stabilitätsgemeinschaft. It must be a community of stability from the German perspective. This is what the court said. With this concept, the court referred to the treaty provisions defining the monetary union as a community that first and foremost guarantees price stability. Now, this was the German tradition of the Bundesbank, and we had to give away our Bundesbank. It was replaced by the European Bank. And uh, for Germany, this is what the court says, it is fundamental that this, um, um, this uh, monetary union will also be a community of stability like before the federal, German Federal Bank model. In order to meet this objective, the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union provides for precautionary measures that constitute a kind of stability pyramid covering three levels. On top, the monetary level, then a financial level, and then a general economic level. At the highest level, the monetary policy level, the euro system stands, which includes the European Central Bank and national central banks of the member states. And it, this uh, system has the exclusive right to determine the money supply in the currency zone and to define and implement the, man, the monetary policy of the union. So this is to do the job of a, note, of, a, of a central bank. On the intermediate level, the financial policy level, 
the EU member states must avoid excessive budgetary deficits in the interest of sustainable financial policy and their activities are supervised and coordinated by the Commission. This is the deficit spending, um, the, the, the prohibition of um, out excessive bud budgetary deficit. Uh, why? I don't want to go into details. This would need some economic background, but uh, this was the, um, the practice that other countries, should I mention some? I, I think I can mention Italy. Italy, <laughs> sorry for that. But Italy had the practice of uh, spending a lot of money um, and uh, the lira was therefore not stable. And we wanted to avoid this uh, uh, from the German point of view. At the lowest level, the economic policy, the member states and the union act with due regard to the principle of an open market economy. This is also said in the treaties. This is uh, what we traditionally call in Germany Ordnungspolitik, an expression that can probably not be translated into English. It is usually used as the German term in, in English too. But this is the, the, the foundation that makes the market economy work uh, without the need of constant intervention by the state in the form of budgetary uh, spending, for example. So it should... Walter Eucken, yes, it's, it's, it's the, um, this series of Eucken and the others. Um, Ludwig Erhard then was the politician who introduced this in the 50s, in the 1950s. And this was, in, according to our understanding, the basis of our economic success after the Second World War. And uh, we, Germany, tried to preserve this kind of stability, uh, the, the, the Ordnungspolitik basis which did not make it necessary to start budget, budgetary spending, money spending like the Italians and some others did. And, and on top, this enabled the central bank, the German central bank to um, um, make a solid and stable policy, monetary policy. Um, now this is this um, architecture, which would me need much more explanation, of course, I can only summarize it in short. This architecture of the euro area is completed by a series of further precautionary measures, including at the level of the monetary policy on top, provisions guaranteeing the full independence of the European Central Bank system, and at the level of financial policy, the intermediate level, prohibiting the granting of loans to the states and privileged access to financial institutions. Uh, as the, the state must not be, get privileged access to borrowing because then the, st the state has uh, an incentive to start po um, deficit spending policies, which should be prohibited. And uh, also the exclusion of all liability of other European member states or the European Union for the commitments, the financial commitments of other member states. This is the so-called no bailout clause. No state should bail out another state that uh, had started to spend too much money and could not pay back this money. Uh, by clearly stating that member states are fully responsible for their own financial affairs, these provisions at the level of financial policy intended to provide an additional incentive for maintaining budgetary discipline. In its Maastricht decision, the Federal Constitutional Court emphasized that this concept was a constitutional sine qua non condition for Germany's ratification of the Maastricht Treaty. When analyzing the Euro system's architecture, the court recognized the monetary union as stable enough. This was the Maastricht regulation um, of the, uh, the, the, the Maastricht ruling of the uh, German constitutional court. It found the relevant provisions to contain sufficient safeguards against the possibility of individual member states to confer consequences of their own dangerous financial policies to other member states and the European Union. And now came the first case uh, in which this became relevant, uh, the so-called EFSM and EFSF case. 
Uh, these short, these abbreviations are confusing. Uh, it's not so important for us, uh, uh, but I will explain what it means. When during the European debt crisis in 2010, Euro area member states decided to grant bilateral loans to one another, mainly it was Greece, uh, Greece was in a serious crisis, and to establish the EFSM, this means European Financial Stability Mechanism, and the EFSF, the European Financial Stability Facility, these were ad hoc funds to pay to, uh, for the debts of Greece, so that uh, Greece did not go bankrupt. Now, this was ad hoc. And of course, to the, according to the German uh, understanding of the treaty, this was a bailout <laughs> which was forbidden, and of which the German Constitutional Court had in 1995, 15 years earlier, said this is absolutely condi conditio sine qua non for us. Now, the court, the federal German, German Federal Constitutional Court repeated its previous statement regarding the concept of monetary union as a community of stability, because there were now individuals in Germany who sued against these facilities against these funds. And the German Constitutional Court repeated its, its statement that the European Union must be a community of stability in financial matters. The court also emphasized the importance of regulations that prohibit the member states from using the central bank's credit facilities and excluded all liability of the Union or the member states for the obligations of other member states. In addition, the court stressed the obligation to preserve true democracy in the member states while creating a united Europe. This is, they said this because uh, Germany was urged <laughs> to pay. Well, because of lo lots of these funds came from Germany, of course. It added that making decisions on public revenues and expenses is an essential part of democratic self-determination in a constitutional state. And you remember in the, in the beginning they said, German must be a state, must, ma must be maintained as a state. And even in the process of European integration, the European Union may become more democratic, but the member states must also be democrat democratic states and must for the future, all the future, be, be democratic <laughs> states. And w one crucial part of democracy is the decision about funding, about money in parliament. In this regard, it pointed out that while the ad hoc EFSM and EFSF me measures were legally acceptable, also they had a grumbling in the stomach, yeah, they said, well, if we were strict and would repeat what we as the court said in 1995, we should actually say this is illegal. Uh, this does not correspond to what Germany signed in 1991 or 92. Um, well, they said this was the first compromise and we will see there is a series of compromises with the, Europe with the German court going back and back and back further and further. So the first compromise is that they said, okay, these are ad hoc measures. Okay, ad hoc measures are only ad hoc, not institutionalized, and they get the consent of the national parliaments. Uh, they got the consent here. German parliament said yes. So no permanent legal institutional international mechanism is established, and that therefore we as the court can say, okay, well, Okay, let's accept it. Despite this court decision, in March 20, one, uh, 2011, one year later only, the European Council decided within the simplified procedure to include a new article 136 to uh, uh, paragraph three to the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. This provision was intended to provide, provide the legal basis for establishing a permanent European stability mechanism. Huh? The first decision in 2010 referred to an ad hoc fund may, uh, for Greece with the consent of the German parliament. Now there is an institutionalized mechanism. They had said it is okay because it's ad hoc and not institutionalized. Next year the European Union came uh, with a plan 
uh, to institutionalize this. And the German court appealed to the European court, which decided in its, no, that it came from Ireland in this case, but um, we waited for the decision, the Pringle, so-called so Pringle decision of 2012, in which the European Court of Justice said it's all okay. Well, um, not only the simplified procedure, which needed no ratification, etc., all these processes, difficult processes, but was a quick procedure. Not only this was in line with the treaty, but also the new Article 136, Paragraph 3, was fully compliant with the full architecture of the European Union and uh, monetary union. And um, so the European Court said it's all okay. The European Court found that there was no violation of the exclusion of, exclusion of liability clause, the no bailout clause. Um, and it also said the financial support by the ISM did not provide for automatic assistance, but depended on political decisions. But of course, these political decisions now were no longer in the parliaments, in the national parliaments, as requested by the German Constitutional Court, but in the European institutions. Despite this, the German Constitutional Court again stepped one step back and said, okay, we can also live with this. Um, the, they had co initially considered the inclusion of the new article as illegal and the introduction of the permanent European uh, stability mechanism um, to be fundamental and legally questionable changes in the structure of the currency union, but they also accepted this grudgingly, the second compromise. So let us summarize it so far. In summary, from the point of view of the German constitution, Germany is obliged to support the development of the European Union, which is attached to democratic, social, federal, and some other principles and protects the fundamental rights. To this end, the German parliament may confer sovereign powers provided that the elements constituting the identity of the German constitution are not violated. Among these elements is the fact that Germany is a state and that it is a democratic state. The Federal Constitutional Court not only has the right, but the obligation to examine whether these conditions and restrictions are observed during the process of conferral of sovereign powers. So far the first part, then the second part, which is a little shorter, uh, the cooperation within the European Union. Well, now the uh, conferral of sovereign powers has happened. Now the European institutions, the organs of the European Union and the national organs that have to fulfill the European decisions um, or to follow the European decisions, they are of course also bound to the European treaties and the European treaties are bound to the national constitutional conditions. Yeah? This is the idea of the German Constitution Court. Now the German state organs are not only bound to the German Constitution when they confer sovereign powers to the European Union, but also when they participate in the European Union's decision-making process or when they implement the European Union's policies in Germany. But compared to the Constitutional Court, a control in the case of parliamentary consent to treaties, which we discussed so far, the judicial supervision of the EU's operational policies constitute a particular problem because the European Union law has priority now over the laws of the member states that conflict with it. And according to the treaties, the responsibility of the Court of Justice of the European Union include the interpretation and the final interpretation of primary and secondary law and the judicial assessment of the activities of the European institutions. And from now on, the, the act of transferal is clearly a question that refers or is in the hands, must be in the hands of the National Constitutional Court. But now the question whether they act according to their sovereign powers transferred to the European Union is a question that has firstly and perhaps exclusively to be decided by the European Union Court but what is the case if the German court says, the European Euro Union court misunderstands 
the uh, uh, treaty and thereby um, uh, breaches the constitutional prerequisites. Uh, this is the dilemma, the problem. And we will see how they try to fix it. Unlike in the case of ordinary international treaties, uh, double taxation treaties or something, which can have at most the rank of federal parliamentary laws in Germany. Yeah, if we have a normal treaty uh, with a other state or a multinational treaty, it has the rank of a German parliamentary law and not the constitution. The constitution is higher. But here, uh, the European Union law claims priority. The claims are higher rank than normal international um, um, treaties. No? Um, the German Constitutional Court essentially confirms the primacy of the European Union law. They say, okay, it's okay, even towards national constitutional provisions. But there are some restrictions. And you may know the Solange decisions. These were the first decisions about this long ago. I don't want to repeat that. Let me directly go to the present questions. As the court pointed out in its judgment on the Maastricht Treaty, European Union law is, from the perspective of constitutional provisions, only a derivative legal system. It's not an originary legal system because the European Union is not a state and is not sovereign. It is a derived legal system whose democratic legitimacy comes from the national legal order in the form of a parliamentary act consenting to the conferral of sovereign powers. This means that, as pointed out earlier, the European Union has no competence to define its own competences. And the member states and their constitutional courts remain the masters of the treaties, as the Constitutional Court said, the Herren der Verträge, the masters of the treaties. Of course, this is then the start of the conflict here. On this basis, the Constitutional Court stated that it must exercise control over EU law, but an offer of diplomacy in a relationship of cooperation. But again, like Staatenverbund, this is something that actually conceals the problems. Eh? It's, it speaks of a relationship of cooperation, but then it says, well, but <laughs> we, we will tell you how we can cooperate um, with the European Court. In this relationship, the European Court has the power to authoritatively interpret the European Union law. But the German Court retains the right to decide whether EU law interpreted in this way can be binding in Germany and for German authorities. This is not the case if the act concerned violates the indispensable elements that give the German constitution its identity. You remember Article 23 in connection with 79, which says that Germany must be a state, a democratic state, a Rechtsstaat, state of the rule of law, etc., a federal state, etc., etc. These basic principles that must never, even with a unanimous decision of parliament, be given up in Germany, according to the constitution. And now also, if a European act interferes with this identity, in other words, turns Germany into a non-state or uh, is un uh, destroys the democracy in Germany, etc., etc., all these things, then the, Euro the German constitutional court will have to interfere, not only has the right, but has the duty to interfere according to their own interpretation. Or, this is the identity question, German I national uh, constitutional identity, or if the act, the European act, falls outside the scope of the competences conferred on the European Union if they act ultra vires. Uh, the Latin expression is probably known, ultra vires, beyond the powers of the European Union. In this context, the court makes a distinction. While it would strongly intervene in any violation of the constitutional identity, in the case of an ultra vires act, it would only react if the violation of competences was sufficiently qualified. Not every violation, but only if it was sufficiently qualified. And what does this mean? It says, if the violation is obvious and important. Yeah, it is, must be obvious, the violation, and it must be fundamental in a certain way. 
acts adopted by European Union bodies, which according to these criteria cannot be considered binding on Germany, must not be enforced by state organs in Germany. This is what the Constitutional Court says. In addition, due to the responsibility for the integration mentioned earlier, borne by the state authorities, they are even obliged to actively oppose these acts under European Union law. The government has to actively oppose, or parliament has to actively oppose European law if, they, if these conditions are met. In other words, they have to take actions to remove them, these acts, from the European and German legal order. Now, again, cases, uh, in this case, two cases, two um, European Union court cases that touched these um, rules. The first, the SMP and OMT case. This became relevant in the context of the monetary union. Again, during the sovereign debt crisis, the European system of central banks launched programs to purchase public bonds of certain euro area member states in order to stabilize these countries financially. Well, at first, the, the point before we had before was when states supported other states. This was in breach, according to the Europe German Constitutional Court's opinion, in breach of the non-bailout provision on the middle level. And now we are on the <laughs> upper level where now the European Central Bank, not the other states, support states, but the European Central Bank supports states, although its sole uh, task is to maintain the stability of the currency and not to support and um, well with funds, with uh, purchase of public, public bonds programs uh, to support states that have got into financial problems. And um, when the German court doubted the legality of these programs under the European treaties, the European court again decided, and it referred to its Pringle decision, uh, and said that the Securities Markets Program, the SMP, and the Outright Monetary Transactions Program did not go beyond the competences of the European Central Bank, and that they were fully in line with the prohibition of granting loans. Well, this was now um, the third case, so to say, uh, in which the German Constitutional Court gave in, finally. They said, okay, <laughs> we are convinced uh, that this is beyond the powers of the European Central Bank, but if the European Court of Justice says it is okay, <laughs> we will again accept it third time. Um, why? They said it is according to our um, uh, to, to our uh, opinion. It is a breach of the treaties, but not an evident breach. <laughs> the ultra vires acts are only controlled if they are evident. I said if they are obvious and very fundamental. And in this case, uh, they said, okay, it's not evident. <laughs> this let the German Constitutional Court look uh, very a week, because it was the third decision of this kind, where they had at first set clear standards and then stepped back uh, to accept the European Court's decisions. But shortly afterwards, the SM, after these SMP and OMT judgments, the European Central Bank went again one step further and did not only buy um, um, uh, the bonds, the public bonds of all the member states, but of those member states that were in special need, Greece, etc. And this was at that time undeniable uh, protection for certain states that had got into trouble. And this was according to the German understanding of the architecture and of uh, an evident breach of the treaty. And the German Constitutional Court announced that it would now not step back. Already in very clear words, unusual, but evidently they felt they, in order not to lose um, the last trust of the lawyers in Germany, they would have to react. And they announced this 
Nevertheless, the European Court of Justice in a very short, and I would say apodictic um, decision, in a very uh, short ruling said, well, it's all okay, no problem. And they did not even discuss, not really discuss the arguments given by the German court. And now it was too much. Uh, sorry, could you just tell, uh, sorry, no, it's okay. Uh, the, the years, that would mean for people of the cases. Yes, it was, um, let, me, let me look it up. Um, it was in 2000, let me see. Two thousand eighteen, maybe two thousand eighteen. I think I must. I would have to check it. Um, yeah, um, it was in two thousand eighteen and twenty. Yeah, and in two thousand eighteen was the OM SMP and OMT case, and in two thousand twenty, uh, these. Um, um, expanded Asset Purchase Program Scheme and Public Sector Purchase Program, <laughs> PSPP decision. Yeah? It's confusing, these abbreviations. Uh, shortly after the SMP and OMT judgment of 2018, uh, the German Constitutional Court brought another question for a preliminary ruling to the European Court, now asking whether the Expanded Assets Purchase Scheme, EAPP, and the Public Sector Purchase Program, PSPP, of the Eurosystem complied with the treaties. Well, these were now these uh, schemes, funding schemes, directly in favor of certain states which were in desperate need for support. Um, although the German court very strongly emphasized its conviction that the ECB was acting ultra, ultra virus, the European Court issued a ruling uh, in December 2018 in which it rejected the doubts. I'm now getting confused. This was 18. Yeah? This uh, European Court's decision was in 2018, on the 11th of December, in which it rejected the doubts. In its rather short and apodictic judgment, the Court of Justice of the European Union repeated the arguments presented in the former case and recognized both of the programs as falling within the European Central Bank's competence. But this time, the Federal Constitutional Court reacted differently. In its judgment issued on the 5th of May 2020, so a little more than one year later, it overruled the European Court's ruling and qualified the European Central Bank's programs as ultra virus acts. And evidently ultra virus. In detail, the court repeated its basic assumption that it was the European Court's prerogative to assess the legality of EU secondary law and EU measures, but it also pointed out that the European Court's jurisdiction ended where its interpretation of the treaties was no longer comprehensible and therefore objectively arbitrary. Now, this was hard stuff, of course. The German Constitutional Court said that the European court, Court's um, uh, decision was not comprehensible and objectively arbitrable. But they had to formulate it like this because they had earlier said only in obvious cases <laughs> uh, they can interfere. And now they had to prove that this was obvious. The Constitutional Court then proceeded to its own review of the ECB's conferred competences. And in this context, it emphasized the strict prohibition of government funding by the European system of central banks and the central bank's primary objective to main, maintain price stability. The court concerned conceded that the European system of central banks is in fact entitled to support the general economic policies of the union but it demanded that the European Central Bank should check the proportionality of the economic consequences that its measures have, and the Central Bank should document its considerations in order to make them accessible to legal control. This is hard to understand. In fact, uh, I cannot understand it. This is again uh, an offer for a compromise. So this was a shot. Uh, in front of the uh, stern of the ship. <laughs> but again, they were compromising, but the European side did not 
react to this offer of another compromise and the European uh, Commission uh, started or opened an infringement procedure against Germany Article two, under Article 258 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. This procedure was closed again on the 2nd of December 2021. As usual in cases like this, no details about the negotiations between the Commission and the federal government of Germany became known. Now, the German federal court was not included, yeah, because in these cases of uh, infringement procedure, it's the case of the government, the national government, and they negotiated with the, um, with the um, Commission. But the Commission informed in a process, in a press release, that the federal government had declared that the Federal Republic of Germany respected the principles of autonomy, priority, efficiency, and uniform application of European law, and that it, the German government was going to do its best in the future to avoid the repetition of such ultra virus rulings of the German Constitutional Court in the future. So the German government had said, we will prevent the German Constitutional Court from doing these kinds of rulings. Of course, uh, what a, we do not know what a declaration of this kind may mean in a constitutional system with an independent constitutional court that is called upon to control the government and to insist on the application of the constitution. Yeah? How can then the German government say, we will care for no such rulings of the constitutional court in the future? Yeah? So this is the end so far of this dispute. And let me sum up. The Federal Constitutional Court of Germany generally recognizes the primacy of the European Union law, of course, while stressing that the member states remain masters of the treaties. And there is also the conflict already in this. It speaks of a relationship of cooperation between both courts in the supervision of the exercise of powers a relationship providing for the power of the German Constitutional Court to determine whether an act of secondary law or another measure of the EU institutions can be considered binding on Germany or not. EU acts are not binding on Germany if they violate the unchangeable elements that give the Constitution of Germany its identity or if they evidently go beyond the powers conferred on the European Union. According to the European treaties and the constitutions of the member states, the European Union is not intended to be a sovereign federal state. At the same time, it is more than just a conventional international organization. It is in fact a new type of integration model called a Staatenverbund by our court which leaves the question of sovereignty open. Obviously, the emerging European system of checks and balances must remain fragile unless it is supported by much goodwill on all sides and based on the common European legal tradition. With its recourse to the legal foundations of the integrational process and with its balanced offer of a relationship of cooperation between the European Court of Justice and the national constitutional courts, the German Federal Constitutional Court shows a wise way for any future development. To strengthen the rule of law means to stabilize the European Union, in my opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This was really very developed uh, and very precise. Uh, plenty of data that we got. Just one thing that uh, I have to share now. In the meantime, I was here. Uh, our colleague Dusan Ilic had a problem, serious health problem down there when he was entering and uh, 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 urgency had to, I, uh, the hit na pomoć, uh, my brain is ambulance. ambulance had to come down, Alexa was taking care about him, he, the, the pressure went high and so on, and they checked him over, mm -hmm. he's okay now just to tell people he is in the office there, but Alexa is taking care about him, and they said, probably some viruses just went, it just happened while we was 
yeah. we were starting actually mm -hmm. and now they are they are okay and alexa is taking care about him sorry for this uh, additional information but we mm -hmm. have to take care about our people and so on so anyway thank you very much uh and of course we have i see one hand uh, and uh, we have time of course for question uh, debate and so on uh, our economist uh, colleague uh, Goran Nikolic. Uh, you have to. Okay. We have five, six people following that on the Zoom as well. Yes. So, because of that, we have to. Um, thank you. Uh, dear Professor, uh, I am uh, interested in the outright monetary uh, operation. Uh, uh, and. Uh, it uh, seems to me that uh, uh, most uh, the Germany can do uh, is to uh, work through uh, European Central Bank. Uh, we see uh, that uh, f so called frugal states, uh, uh, including Germany, are blocking uh, some efforts to, to be more. Uh, uh, flexible uh, uh, regarding the monetary policy. We see in the European monetary system um, uh, that uh, member from Germany is always uh, restrictive uh, and blocking uh, something, but it is, it is not uh, power of veto. Uh, we, we see that in the, the decision to uh, make uh, capital uh, uh, allo allocation according to um, uh, GDP of countries. Uh, it means that uh, when uh, European Central Bank uh, uh, give, uh, for example, to Italy or to Greece uh, 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 to buying uh, bonds, uh, it was uh, uh, calculated as a part of uh, obligation of these countries uh, and it is some some kind of compromise and uh, generally uh, everything about uh, draggy decision to go with uh, aggressive monetary policy is about uh, uh, redistribution and pres preserving uh, monetary stability and I don't see they uh, to 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 prevent this policy in practical terms, maybe in political terms, in in in, uh, mm -hmm. in uh, law, it is it is clear that it is a violation of uh, of treaty. But uh, what 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 do you see in the perspective? Uh, I, I don't see any chance uh, for Germany to stop, and for other fr frugal states to to stop <laughs> this kind of policy of. Uh, of uh, European Central Bank that is uh, for uh, that is good for country like Italy, Greece, uh, mm -hmm. France, yes. France, and so on. Thank yeah, thank you very much for this question. It is a very crucial question, of course. Um, I would like to go step back um, for a step and to go back to the historical. Um, facts that led to this situation. Um, the European currency was came uh, on the uh, it was a wish of the French side when Germany was reunited. It is it has long been denied but it is now evident from the sources um, that François Mitterrand said we will only agree to German reunification if uh, Germany gives away its sovereignty in uh, monetary questions. Uh, and uh, before that, this had already been um, um, intended by the French side years before that. Um, and Germany had also always answered, yes, we will do this if the French um, give their um, force de frappe, the atomic bombs, into the European Union. Huh? This we will make a change. Huh? We will give our um, because uh, one of the French politicians had said before the German uh, Bundesbank is its German force de frappe, and then the Germans said, "Okay, yes, we, if we we will give this um, 
Bundesbank, our money, into European control. This means we give up our own full control of our currency if you do the same with your force to frappe. These are highly political questions, of course, have long been denied, but are now evident. And uh, the French came again when German unification was at the verge. And uh, you know that the, according to mainstream opinion in international law and in German constitutional law, uh, Germany was not fully sovereign until 1990. Um, but the four uh, allied powers, the United States, the Soviet Union, Britain and uh, France, had a veto right or had the, had the last word in sovereignty questions about the whole of Germany, yeah, including Germany in the uh, borders of 1937. Now, this is the uh, international law background of this. And Germany, of course, could have said, well, we will do it without the consent, re German reunification, but this would have brought uh, enormous trouble on the international level. So the German government said, okay, uh, we will do it if France blackmails us. Well, they didn't say that, of course, but let me be more open uh, um, and perhaps a little, a little undiplomatic. Uh, if, if France blackmails us, okay, let's do it. Uh, well, we have to do it in order not to have problems with reunification. Uh, we will give away our force to frappe, our national bank, to the European control without French uh, forced to frapp uh, to the European Union. And uh, uh, this was not only Mitterrand, but it was also um, Thatcher. Uh, Margaret Thatcher heard of the idea of Mitterrand and said, oh, well, this is a good idea and we will support this. So Germany would have had serious problems with two, in, the, in its unification process, with two of the allied powers, who, according to mainstream opinion in international law, in fact had the last say about German um, conditions uh, for the future, uh, so German sovereignty. Um, then we had this unification pact uh, or treaty with the, the two plus four treaty, as we call it, the two German states concluded this international treaty with the four allied powers, in which the allied powers said, okay, we will give back so full sovereignty to the new German state, but Germany had to promise several things, among them to give up the German currency, for a future common European currency. No? And then in Germany, of course, there was, this was not popular at all because um, what we had during the years after the war was our economic wealth. We had no power, we knew that, but we had economic wealth and we did not want to lose that. So the German government had to do its best to convince the Germans um, Kohl, Helmut Kohl had to convince, uh, our chancellor had to convince the Germans that this decision was not only necessary because the Germans may have revolted if they had heard that the French had blackmailed us. He never talked about that, but he said, um, this is good in, for us. This is in fact good for us. Why is it good for us? He said, because this will lead to a further step to European integration, and he was an integrationist, and he knew that in Germany, uh, there was a very strong mood towards integration, much more than in any other state in Europe. Uh, so he said, we will give this uh, sovereignty in monetary questions to the European Union, and this will lead us another step towards a united Europe, perhaps a federal state of Europe. And um, this is what they did. But then there was opposition in Germany against giving up the Deutsche Mark and giving up the national banks, uh, sovereignty, so to say, in these questions. And uh, he then negotiated an EU treaty in which this architecture took over many elements that were traditionally followed in Germany uh, for our German national uh, monetary policy under the Bundesbank, the federal bank. Uh, this means Ordnungspolitik at the basis, then a very disciplined budgetary policy on the financial level, financial policy level, and then on the monetary level, full independence of the national bank and no right of the, or no power of the national bank to finance lender or the federal government or anything. Yeah, this was strictly forbidden. So the German Bundesbank model, which was by the way, not written down in our constitution, it had simply evolved. It was simply a practice, but we then convinced the other states 
pressurized, you may also say, pressurized the other states uh, in the uh, Maastricht Treaty to sign provisions that reflected the German philosophy of a stable uh, currency. And this was then uh, how Kohl convinced the German nation to enter this European Union, which was after unification. We had what we wanted, <laughs> but we had promised secretly to give up the Deutsche Mark. He, he never said this openly, but he worked in this direction to keep his promise. And um, we then got the, uh, the Maastricht Treaty with this stable construction for the euro currency. The Germans were, they doubted whether it was good, but more and more people were convinced, okay, if this state is as constructed to, according to our own good principles, we will agree. Yeah? And, uh, and then also the German Constitutional Court with the same considerations agreed. They said, okay, we can say yes, although we have doubts, they had doubts um, about the constitutionality of this Maastricht Treaty. They said, okay, we see the pol highly political background. We know about the secret negotiations. And um, we will say yes, but we say yes with a but. <laughs> and we rewrite this into the ruling. We said, yes, but it must be a community of stability. And this means, and then they interpreted the, uh, the uh, treaty in the German way. In some points, it is not absolutely clear, the treaty wording. But then the German Constitution Court said, this is only constitutional from our side, and we will only cooperate in, under this regime if it will be interpreted the following way. And then they set out clear rules. And in the years later, the European Union broke one after the other of these rules. First on the financial level, no bailout. They did bail out. I, I tried to uh, show you the steps. And then on the level of the monetary policy by the European Central Bank, led by an Italian. Uh, <laughs> And uh, of course, in Germany, um, the traditional lawyers and economists said, now is exactly what's happening, what we feared and we tried to prevent. And we told our partners in the negotiations of the treaties, we insist on this. And later, the German Constitutional Court in 1995, when it decided about this construction, it also insisted on this. And everybody was notified. And they all said, yes, yes, we understood. Let's start with the euro currency. And they took states like Italy. Italy, for perhaps for a political reason, had to participate. It's a founding member of the European Economic Community. But Greece, everybody knew that Greece would tumble. It was evident. It was evident that Greece would not stand this shock of stability necessities and they would tumble. And therefore then, uh, and despite that, Greece was taken up. Uh, we know that they forged their balances with the help of an American bank, etc., etc. This was all known before they entered. Nevertheless, there was again pressure on, uh, on all sides to let Greece enter. And then happened what had to happen. And the German traditional lawyers and the traditional economists said, this is what we saw in advance. And, and therefore, the German Constitutional Court came under strong pressure again and again to emphasize, but we did agree on this. We did agree on that. OK. And uh, the Euro European institutions, in the end, and the European Central Bank under Draghi, they said, we don't care about it. Of course, they said, now we have the problem because when we took up Greece, this was the mistake. And after that, what to do? We cannot let Greece suffer. Of course, what can we do? We can break the law. Although in advance, we knew we would have to break the law if we take up Greece. So this is a tragedy. And it is a tragedy that did not happen without knowing in advance. And uh, we can judge it like this or like that personally, but we should know what happened. We should know what happened, and I think we should talk about it, what happened, uh, because uh, what in fact happened was um, seeingly the others 
or some of the others entered into this construction with the intention of not following it in the end. And with the consequence first that the European currency would not be stable, this was one of the fears of the Germans, and secondly, that Germany would have to fund over and over again some of the other countries that did not um, have a serious, in our sense, serious economic policy. Of course, it is delicate to say this in public, but it must be said somewhere and somewhere. And I increasingly uh, say, talk about these things, uh, uh, like here. I know that it is not friendly towards the Greece, Greeks or the Italians to say these things. They might not hear, hear it, but it must be said. Let us openly discuss these things. Why did Greece enter this monetary union, although all the experts said in advance, you will suffer or you will have to be funded by the others, and both happened. They suffered, they were funded by the others, but only funded uh, by submitting, when they submitted to the rules of the International Monetary Fund, which meant uh, incredible cuts into the sovereignty of the uh, policy of the government of Greece. They had to dismiss uh, a lot of civil servants, also some of our colleagues, we talked to them in this, they lost their jobs or lost money, et cetera, et cetera. It was um, a tragedy that could, and, and it was foreseen. It was, the, it was precast. They, everybody knew, the experts knew about it. Uh, th there's uh, one more uh, dimension, if I could say, I didn't mention that, but it's very important why the rule of law and the position of rule of law in Europe today and in Germany properly is becoming more and more problematic, you know, they, because uh, uh, that's, I mean, this is the dimension we also have to emphasize because Professor Morgenthaler is included also in one very important project in, in uh, Germany where there are more than 700 uh, professors, uh, university teachers, and so on, who have started from a different ideological, political, and party background, uh, who have started fight for a basic freedom of teaching and freedom of law, which is also deeply endangered uh, at German universities and so on. I mean, so the whole dimension that, okay, we should at least speak that this is breaking of the law because once you start with you know the level of european union okay now we have to accept it and so on that is spreading to different ways of understanding uh, what is the freedom which should be guaranteed by the freedom of law that's just wanted to add uh, you may uh, uh, just said the afterwards maybe about what you've been doing for the freedom and so on i saw uh, professor Zlecevic, uh just mike Okay, thank you, Professor Morgenthaler. I mean, you, you mentioned so many things, and there is so many discussions about your, <laughs> about your, and uh, I'm glad that you are here because you have in sort of Serbian origins also with, the, with, the, with your family, which lived in, in this, in, in the area of Novi Sad. You mentioned so many things. For, for, first of all, François Mitterrand. I was a French student, and I want to ask you a simple question. Who is the winner of the introduction of euros? The Germany. Germany is the winner, not François Mitterrand. <laughs> it was his big mistake, and I will explain you why. Germany, it's a very, uh, very strong in the industrial power with a strong industry. What is good for Germany with a single currency? They, the Germany exports cars, machines, everything. And the Germany now will not be paid in some weak Greek, Italian, or I don't know what currency, the German companies will be paid in euros, and euro is stable, is good, uh, is good currency. I mean, the German is the winner of this, this story. 
The second thing, <clears throat> I, I also, uh, why is that? And we come also in the story of what is the European Union? If you, if you consider that European Union is international organization, it's the end of the story. Because why? European Union cannot be an international organization. And you give the, the proof of all that. If you think, if you talk about European Central Bank, European currency, European single market, what is that? It's a federal economy. You don't have customs. You don't have different currency. You don't have any uh, measures of protection. What is the European Union? Economically speaking, it's federal area. And uh, the second thing also, if we're speaking about European law, uh, what is, uh, what is the problem uh, with the, uh, uh, I mean, if you say the European Union is international integration, you have a solution. You are not in America, you're not in the Russian Federation. You can leave the European Union. It's very simple. And the Great Britain do it, did it. Sorry, you can leave it. It's not a prison. But if you are in the European Union, you must accept the philosophy that European Union is a sort of federal community which intention was to be a federal state like United States of America. And what is the problem of, of the German, uh, uh, German Supreme Court or General Constitutional Court? After reunification of the Germany in 1989, there is a, some changing in the philosophy Germany becomes, before that, Germany and France was equal, practically equal. After reunification of Germany, Germany becomes the most important territorially with the population and economically country of the European Union. I think that Germany didn't have the interest to transfer powers to the Brussels. Why? Germany is the most powerful state of the European Union. And uh, there is a changing of thinking, of the way of thinking. No, European Union is not a federal construction. We are sovereign. We have our legal system. We cannot, but all, everything proves you something else. You mentioned uh, uh, the Article uh, 256. What is the Article 250? If some member states didn't respect the Euro European law, the European Court of Justice will pronounce the sanction against him. And that's a federal model. That's federal model of Supreme Court and, uh, and uh, the national courts, which they're more, they're, they must listen to the Supreme Federal Court as in the United States. And that is the philosophy of the, of the European Union. And that's why uh, the European Court of Justice remembers all the member states that the European Union has this sort of federal legal system. If you don't want this legal system, I mean, the best is to go out, leave. <laughs> you don't have so many solutions. You know? Would you like to? Uh, uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I have to go, but I would. I wanted just to say that uh, to thank you for your extremely clear and uh, well organized uh, expose, and uh, it was pleasure to to listen to you. Uh, but uh, maybe just to, to add a little bit is is this uh, that, that it's very complex actually issue and you uh, succeed in explaining this. But it has three three issues: political, economic, and the legal. And on the legal, 
uh, issue that there is uh, it, this uh, German uh, decisions actually are are included in much larger uh, uh, discussion between constitutional courts in and the European court in other countries also. We know very well that we have a much tougher discussion between Pol Poland and Polish uh, constitutional court and European court. And I think as, uh, as we t talk today, there is still this fine on uh, 1 million euros per day that uh, that been decided against Poland by European court, like a taximeter. And uh, well, uh, in, in this way, the, the issue is actually how to preserve a commu community of rule of law on a European level uh, with, with this uh, different position that, that may uh, somehow uh, derived towards uh, total disintegration of le uh, legal uh, uh, <coughs> harmony, I would say, that is tried to, to promote by European court with this uh, concept of privacy that, that is actually the, in, the, in the heart of the, of the discussion. Thank you. Maybe a, one, one sentence uh, again. Um, uh, you have a passport. And probably in your passport, it's marked European Union and German Federal Republic of uh, Federal Republic of Germany. Tell me, which is the international organization which have this mentioned on your pass on, on passports? Only the European Union. European Union, it's not. In my view, it's not international organization. It's much more than that. You don't have the passports. You don't have the citizenship. You have the double citizenship of European Union and the German. Okay, that's it. One, 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 one of the remarks. Thank you very much. The first question was the economic advantage. Well, this is the question. What, who has the economic advantage? There is much uh, dispute about that, and I'm not an economist. But um, what I wanted to emphasize is the necessity of um, a certain stable uh, constitution for the, let us say, constitution or architecture uh, for the uh, currency. And if this uh, uh, stable, this constitution or this architecture is not stable, uh, the currency might one day tumble. Yeah? And this is the danger we have so far. Um, tried to fix the problems, but the crisis is constant. We have, a const have had a constant crisis since the introduction of this of the euro, and um, I would, and as a lawyer, I must uh, uh, insist on the fact that there is a, an architecture and that we have to follow that. Otherwise. Um, the, 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 the idea of the law suffers itself. And let me come to the other, is, is the European uh, Union a federation or a federal union and uh, the passport, sorry? Federal community, yes. These are all expressions that are not fixed. Eh? There are, there's a federal state or there is an international organization and there may be something in between. Um, but the question is what it is. As I said myself, that of course it is more than an international organization, but what is it? It is not a state. It's definitely not a state because it's first not intended to be a state. None of the treaties says it. Um, for example, take the passport question. Uh, the passport, the European um, uh, uh, nationality, so to say, the citizenship, they, they speak of citizenship, not of nationality, um, is derived. Uh, it is, you cannot apply to the Euro European Commission and say, I want to be a European now without being French or German or something. You get a passport from one of the member countries and they have their own rules for giving passports to anybody. And then you also get, as an appendix, the uh, European citizenship. The same is with the territories. The European Union it consists of the territories of certain member states. And if the territories of these member states change, the territory of the European Union changes. And the same is the case with the third element. We have the territory, we have the people, and the third element of statehood is um, government, is power. And this power is 
limited. Yeah? The, 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 con the treaties say that they can only exercise the powers that they have been um, um, transferred or that have been um, uh, given to them. Uh, therefore, uh, according to the treaties, the European Union is not intended to be a state. And it is, in fact, not uh, uh, um, a state in many other respects because it has no power for foreign policy, for uh, defense, and so on. So what we have is an incomplete model uh, of a state, of a federal state, but it is incomplete. Yeah? And, uh, and therefore, we must be careful not to weaken the member states so much that they uh, are no longer the masters of their destiny, uh, whereas we have an, a European Union which is not yet capable of offering uh, the functions that a state normally has. And uh, unlike the United States, for example, the, the United States um, were also, are also a federation originally of 13 member states, and then they became more, um, but they were always intended to be a state. Yeah? And uh, the European Union uh, has never been intended to be that, and I see many from France and other countries, uh, they do not want this. Uh, there was the wish in Germany more than anywhere else to form a European federal state, but uh, this was never followed by any other state as far as I can see. And therefore, I must say, uh, we have um, agreed on the cooperation in certain fields, but these fields are now already crucial, yeah? financial policy, monetary policy, but we have then to follow these rules strictly. And if we don't follow them, if we, why should we uh, uh, sign any new treaty on integration in the future if we know that uh, some other states and the European Court of Justice are not prepared to um, cling to these uh, regulations? Why are they are prepared to give it up for necessities or for whatever? Um, this will not be accepted by the na by the people I, i'm sure at least not in germany we we are we fear uh, that we might get into a situation uh, where we give of core competences of a state that are necessary for our protection uh, without getting anything for it uh? and um, i can only uh, plead uh, it is absolutely necessary to, to, to cling to the treaties. Uh, what we have agreed upon must be followed in the future too. And if we get the feeling, and there is a widespread feeling now, uh, that this does not happen, well, uh, what is the future of the European Union? And uh, you say you can leave it, of course, but we don't want to leave it. We want this European Union. And the second question, could we leave it like Britain? Britain was never as integrated. They were not the members of the Schengen uh, area. They were not members of the uh, currency union. And they had uh, several other privileges, uh, which made it easier. And still, it was very difficult uh, to uh, see uh, Britain going. There's very, very many questions. Um, only diffi with difficulties, uh, the British could go. And what would happen if the country that is in the center uh, of all this um, would go? Uh, quite apart from questions of whether this would be politically possible, yeah? because the European Union, of course, has a function. And uh, we are well aware of the fact that it has to do with the potential power of Germany in the center uh, of Europe. Um, and we want to have this. We want to stabilize this, uh, but we insist that what we have agreed upon must be followed. This is what I try to say. Uh, let me co continue along this line what uh, Professor Lopandic already mentioned. I have two things to, to, to ask. So one is uh, exactly about the position of other national constitutional courts. Mm -hmm. Uh, as we know, Greece, Ireland, you will uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and several others had the ruling of their own, which were insisting that the whole thing that was going on about 2010 and, uh, you know, the, this uh, uh, 
reductions on the austerity that was imposed to Greece were unconstitutional in many ways. But as Professor Samadzic mentioned in his book, nobody paid attention upon that and nobody cares about constitutional care. Unfortunately, constitutional court in or, or Ireland, Greece or any other countries, which is again very problematic for democratic order and rule of law generally in Europe, but in those countries as well. And But of course, you know, uh, uh, German and Poland, especially in our something else. So mm -hmm. my question is uh, actually two questions on, on those cluster. One is about your uh, idea, if we could predict about the future or behavior of the uh, German, of the Karlsruhe, German Constitutional Court. The last sequence was what you said about the uh, German federal government, which says that it will prevent uh, uh, German constitutional court for doing its job, actually. So was there any, how should I say, statement or position of the court himself? And what can you predict about the future uh, uh, of, of work or, or position of the Karlsruhe? Uh, is it going uh, to follow this political statement of the government? Or it will be quiet? Or we could maybe accept in the future that they come out to be more decisive uh, according to line of Zolonga and everything. And uh, another one is about the Polish Constitutional Court. This is, I think, as, as Professor Lopadic already said, probably the most, uh, uh, how should I say, the most decisive, uh, the, the most, uh, for Europe, in a way, dangerous or let me say the most pressing issue, because if I'm correct, they were quoting already German precedent and insisting actually that they are following the lines of the German Constitutional Court. Uh, and my question is actually this about the prediction, could we get more of those statements of some of the serious constitutional courts who will block this kind of ultra virus behavior of ECP, uh, ESP, and uh, uh, European institutions. So let me say it's more like cluster, but you understand very well. Mm -hmm. And another one is I'm very specific to hear about that, about the position of Europe. Uh, Professor uh, Zecevic already gave this general perception outside of Europe that Germany is somebody who is, in a way, uh, profiting the most from the global market and one currency. Uh, and so on, uh, and that actually even the, the, the fight of Angela Merkel to preserve Euro, not only as a, let me say, financial, but even more geopolitical, geoeconomical term in a way is a great success, above all Merkel in Germany, uh, because we saw that Soros, uh, Krugman and other guys from America were strongly uh, attacking against that. On the other hand, I know that especially Mark Sote is very be belonging to those people who are very critical toward Euro from the beginning and that he thinks that generally this is the big burden for Germany that uh, you should do something about retreating, well, re 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 regaining uh, sovereignty over that and so on. So I would like to, to hear your position on those issues and thank you very much for that. Thank you. So the first question was um, uh, what the German Constitutional Court will do. Uh, they have not given any comment uh, to this um, uh, talks about between the, uh, the Commission, the European Commission and the German federal government. Uh, they did not comment on that, which is natural. <laughs> of course, the court has no speaker in this sense and uh, it is wise for a court not to comment on these things. Yeah. Uh, how they will react um, is open, of course. Uh, I think they will react or will act as in the future as they have acted in the past. They will always at first um, emphasize the fact that uh, the European Union is a constitutional goal and is very important for Germany, and uh, that generally uh, Germany, of course, ex accepts uh, the primacy of European law, et cetera, et cetera, all these things. Um, but uh, that they have a certain um, responsibility for the German constitution. 
I outlined what is the, con the intent, the content of this uh, constitution according to our constitutional court, and that they um, retain the competence to give a dissenting opinion, so to say, uh, the, which they did in the Solange decision. The Solange decision was that the European Union, or at that time not yet Union community, did not have um, a set of human rights, a human rights catalog. And they made decisions that were against the human rights in the understanding of the German Constitutional Court, and basic human rights. So the German Constitutional Court as long as said then, as long as, it was in the 1970s or so, as long as the European community does not have a written catalog of uh, human rights, the German Constitutional Court retains the right to interfere in serious breaches of, inter, uh, of human rights. And then there was an upcry and uh, say the Germans, the German court uh, destroys the European integration process. No, but what was, what, what was the consequence? The European uh, institutions uh, obliged themselves in a strange act of self-obligation to follow the European uh, uh, catalog of human rights. Uh, and this was a success, of course. And then the German court could say, okay, as long as they do that, we are happy. Uh, we can step back and uh, we will not interfere. And now uh, they did the same. And I said with um, pragmatism or with uh, um, the, they stepped back even. And they said, but they always said, they put up the sign and said, now stop it, stop it, stop it. And if you don't stop it, we might react. And then at the fourth decision, then they finally reacted. And uh, we can only hope that this will lead to uh, corrections in the behavior of the European institutions. I'm not sure whether it will, but um, this is our hope. And what the German Constitutional Court will do in the future, we don't know. They will wait and see. But they have this um, emergency uh, <laughs> break, so to say, uh, which they can use. The German federal government cannot forbid the German Constitutional Court to do its job. We are a, con a constitutional state and um, we will see. Uh, the Polish Constitutional Court, um, I'm not an expert in all these questions. The other constitutional courts in Europe, they have different um, 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 rulings. Uh, um, uh, the Polish Constitutional Court is probably the one that is most um, Pro uh, uh, sovereignty. Uh, it is. They are. It's. Uh, Poland is a state that uh, highly estimates its own sovereignty for certain reasons. Of course, we all know. Uh, there for, for a long time there was no Polish state, and then when it existed, it came under the dominance of the Soviet Union, etc. And uh, they are now very uh, proud and very aware of their national independence. And uh, this is also reflected, of course, in the uh, Polish, in the, in the rulings of the Polish Constitutional Court. And they were very happy, of course, to see that the German Constitutional Court also uh, decided in this direction. And they are strongly emphasizing this now. Um, what we see is that I tried to point out very strictly from a dogmatical point of view what is the constitutional perspective on these questions from the German constitution point. And I also pointed out that there must be compromises because it is a political process. Um, it's always the question, how far can the compromises go? And also the other constitutional courts will have to make compromises. <laughs> If the German Constitutional Court claims that there is a, a, a relationship of cooperation between the Constitutional Court of the European Union or the Court of the European Union and the National Constitutional Court, this also refers to the others, of course. And uh, there is some pragmatism is needed, uh, but it should be on the basis of a common European spirit, whatever this is, but uh, there is something like that. And we can only hope that all the courts including the European court, develop this spirit. And from, from, the, from the Polish constitutional court, like from the German, we must 
expect a certain solidarity with the European Union, not absolute strictness in their own dogmatical approach, but from the European Court of Justice, we must expect that they take serious the treaties and also the limits, of course, the limits uh, to the power of the European Union included in these treaties. And, uh, and this is what, where I see most uh, <laughs> demand so far. Yeah. I, thought, I think I expressed this. What was your last question? Euro. Another one was about the Euro. The Euro. Yeah. Uh, where I see the future of the Euro? Or? Yeah, I mean, in general, we, we, we mentioned, I will repeat it briefly, Professor Zetschew started actually that perception outside of ah. Germany, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and that on the other side that uh, Mark Sotte think that this is something that is against the interests of Germany and so on. So what's your perspective upon that? Uh, was Euro worth of it or its problem for Germany in long-term perspective? From a purely economic perspective, um, it, is, it is difficult to say. Of course, uh, it can be positive uh, uh, because we then have a the pr no problem with conversion of currencies, etc., instable currencies. But uh, if these instable countries make our own currency instable and make us fund them if we want or not uh, over and over again, this may be in the end be a negative business. For me, it's not a business question. I think you understand. I'm not. I'm more political or legal minded than economic minded. I would say even if we have costs, if we can preserve um, peace and if we can preserve um, good understanding among neighbors, I would say yes, yeah, let's do it. Uh, but you are asking for the purely economic aspect. Um, we can profit from it if it is well done and we will suffer if it tumbles and this is crucial. And I can only be sure it will not tumble if this architecture is followed. And they are not following it. They have given up one element after the other. And we have had a permanent crisis since uh, the introduction of the euro, mainly after a few years when these, this world crisis, the coming over from the United States, the, you know, the uh, crisis, um, when it began, uh, until then, there was good weather. In good weather, everything is fine. But when a crisis starts and uh, one national economy gets problems, uh, all the others have to support somehow. And this can become worse. I think it can only become worse in the future. It will become worse. We now have other crises, uh, energy crises, etc., etc., And we will see uh, where it will lead. The good weather, I'm, I hope I'm not too I don't want to be too pessimistic. Um, we must always look into the future with a certain confidence. But uh, we have had so many crises and additional crises without solving the old ones. They are adding. And uh, the migration crisis is, has an economic component. The um, energy crisis evidently has an economic component. We are not only talking of economic questions. Yeah? All the other questions must also be seen. but. Now, purely this aspect, uh, we have added crisis to crisis, and we have not solved any one of these crises. And why not? For many reasons, of course, again, but because the nation states no longer have the full capacity of solving uh, the, the crisis, and the European Union not yet has the capacity. We have a kind of blocking mutual blocking of solutions. And, uh, and this makes me a little pessimistic. Because you've asked, so how do I see it? I don't want to be pessimistic. I'm always trying to encourage people uh, to see things. Uh, but the first thing is, positively, uh, but uh, the first thing is to talk about potential risks uh, and try, out, try to find out the reasons. And we may have different opinions on that. Uh, this is normal. This is normal. This is not normal, not only normal in, in, in science or academia to have disputes and to talk about them, but also in democracy. 
and we must uh, or in international relations we should talk about these things and not um, put them into a dark corner because this will not help to solve the problems and this is what you said i mean this uh, network for freedom of academic uh, speech or academic um, freedom in, as a whole uh, I, I see that uh, the um, space for public discussion in many fields is narrowing. And the same is the case in international relations, mainly also concerning Germany because of the past. Uh, in Germany uh, cannot or thinks it cannot openly defend its own interests. But I would say it would be much more honest and I'm sure it would be honored by our neighbors if we did. Not in an aggressive way, of course, in a friendly way, but we must define our interests. I try to define it in the respect of the currency and then to talk about it. And if others have a different approach, let's negotiate and see whether we can find an architecture that works. Yeah? We have some more comments, question, uh, colleague, uh, please. Please. Ja, hallo, äh, herzlich willkommen in Belgrad. Äh, vielen Dank für Ihre aufschlussreiche Vorstellung. You mentioned, of course, uh, a lot of things, as uh, as Professor Zetchevich uh, earlier mentioned this as well. But my question would be: Are there any political repercussions of uh, these uh, clashes between different viewpoints of the German Constitutional Court and the European Court of Justice uh, in terms of? Uh, is uh, this a perhaps a boost of Euroscepticism? A, 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 the the uh, clash between the German Constitutional Court and the European Court of Justice does it represent a sort of a um, uh, uh, cause of uh, certain Eurosceptic trends in Europe? Um, I mean, uh, are there any evidence of rising Euroscepticism in this sense? Uh, since it's, it seems to me as though if the uh, political system of the European Union is in, in a certain state of a blockade right now. I mean, it, uh, the decision-making process is uh, practically uh, uh, frozen, uh, especially uh, the uh, very important uh, decisions regarding the uh, certain policies, uh, such as um, uh, defense, uh, such as, um, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the crisis that are actually multiplicating. Uh, but you didn't mention the war crisis that Europe is currently in. Uh, that is, of course, the key uh, point uh, that will uh, further, uh, it seems to me, uh, 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 direct European integration in a complete other uh, direction. And um, uh, since the decision-making process is in this kind of uh, frozen status in a blockade, um, does this all uh, cause uh, certain political repercussions uh, in European democracies as such? Uh, it seems to me as though the answer is yes, but uh, how about uh, in this case, uh, uh, between uh, 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 this case of clashes between the different viewpoints of the German Constitutional Court and the European Court of Justice? Mm. Danke. Yes, thank you very much for this question. Uh, the you, you spoke of Euroscepticism, and there may be a Euroscepticism or the potential for Euroscepticism, but the two positions I was comparing or uh, confronting to each other were pro-European stances. Uh, the European Court of Justice, of course, is pro-European, but the Euro German, German Federal Co uh, Constitutional Court is also pro-European. I do not want uh, to have the understanding that it is anti-European. This is what some of the critics say, but this is unfair. They want to have a uh, uh, European Union that follows the rules that were agreed upon. And these rules that were agreed upon in the eyes of the G German Constitutional Court were, are the rules that would make a better 
functioning of the European Union and the, mainly the monetary uh, union. Uh, so we have a dispute about two different ways leading to the same goal. It's not anti-European, but it is uh, a criticism of the precise way that uh, certain institutions are following uh, this goal. And, um, and therefore, I do not see, in Germany, I do not see any strong power that is anti-European. Unlike perhaps in some other countries, I, I don't know exactly, uh, but we have never had a strong movement in Germany that is anti-European in the sense of anti-European Union. Huh? Never, never. Uh, what we are discussing, and not so much in the public, more among experts, is the way how to get forward in Europe. And uh, we should also more discuss the final goal, uh, what the French call the finalité de, de l'Union Euro, Européenne, uh, the, the final model. <laughs> Where are we going? How are we going? You mentioned a federal community, you said, but what is a federal community or a Staatenverbund? What is a Staatenverbund? Uh, but these are not, or at least Staatenverbund, is the attempt to describe what we have. But where are we going? We don't know. And there is no, not even among the academics in our country and as far as I see in the other countries too, a really serious and intensive discussions about where the whole project may lead us to. We, we should not only dream of ideal situation, I'm not, in, encouraging this, I'm, let us realistically talk what we try to establish. And we are not doing that. Uh, even in the treaties, uh, it says, uh, the Maastricht Treaty said, this treaty is another step on our way, I don't know the exact formulation, on our way towards a closer, ever closer, ever closer union. Ever closer, thank you very much, ever closer union. But, what is the union and what is the close union we want? Is it a federal state? Well, is actually, actually, the French and the Dutch rejected the constitution of Europe in, in 2005, if, yes. if, if you recall. So actually, the Europeans themselves sabotaged the European project in a certain sense. Sorry, I didn't get the, it. The Europeans themselves sabotaged the finalité politique uh, of, of the European project itself. Well, some, some nations who did not, uh, did not agree sabotaged it, if you will. I would not call it that. Of course, it's a, it's a legal right to say yes or no, the nations. But um, I would inject, in fact, um, personally now, you asked, I think you asked for my personal uh, stance towards that. I would really be happy if we had something like a confederation with a government that is responsible of the core questions for all European states with as much sovereignty as possible for the nation states, but um, uh, um, decisive powers in the fields of security and foreign policy and uh, economics for the European Union. This is my personal attitude, but in all the other fields, let us try even to give back sovereignty to the nation states. And uh, also let us um, try to improve the, uh, the institutions of the European Union so that the decision-making processes are more transparent. Yeah? I could talk about that too, but uh, you know probably what I mean, that many of the core decisions are made behind closed doors and come out as compromises. And afterwards, everyone who participated in this compromise said, yes, but this is not what I wanted. Because nobody ever wants a compromise. Yeah. Uh, so the compromise, what comes out in the end, without a public discussion, you cannot see who contributed in which way to this compromise. And so this is a very problematic situation. I would really say uh, some core competences to the European Union that make the European Union strong uh, on the international, on the global level, 
uh, but as little as possible, all the rest to the nation states and uh, transparent decision making uh, of a government uh, that is really dependent on, on democratic control or is, is under democratic control. Do we have something at Zoom or? No? Okay, so we are working for more than two hours already and it's about time to, to finish. Do we have some comment more or anything? And I think it's about the time that we close our today's discussion. Uh, uh, before I finish, actually, I really want to thank you very much for, for coming. And this was more than informative. Uh, we got quite, a, uh, as colleagues already said, very detailed, very uh, um, uh, uh, co continuity-based uh, uh, overview and uh, even some, I would say, perspective that is a little bit different from what is really generally presented here and so on. And uh, now we, we are finishing our uh, formal part of after that you will be finally free. I'm joking a little bit, but I can't help uh, uh, but to ask you one, one question that is, you know, floating around and we all have ideas about that. I will respect the level you might answer, but I think it's a little bit, uh, I, in a way, crucial for all of us, including Europe and position of Egypt. And this is actually an idea, if I could formulate, how sovereign Germany is today, in a way. I'm asking you as a lawyer, in a good German tradition of understanding what sovereignty means and, and so on. How, uh, I mean, taking care about everything, the position up until 1990 and 91, and these 32 years, especially in the light of, let me say, post Merkel government. And with that, I'm finishing, and thank you very much for, for everything. Please. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, well, sovereignty in Germany now is sovereign on uh, strictly legal uh, terms uh, since the reunification and uh, since the full sovereignty was given back to Germany uh, but um, sovereignty also has a political component of course what can you do and this is like comparing with freedom yeah? we are all free but in fact there are certain um, limits or certain yeah certain conditions for we have families which we have to consider and we have friends etc and uh, here it is the same of course uh, Germany is in a position in the center of Europe where we have a lot of neighbors and we have to get on as well as possible with them and this means that we have to take certain um, um, considerations or responsibilities and this uh, we have formalized this in the European Union huh? uh, mainly of course in other contexts too um, and um, in this case Germany is theoretically free to leave as you said but in fact it is not uh, it would be nobody in Germany would f ah, well nobody but nearly nobody in Germany would favor uh, this um, all we can do is try to improve, do our best to improve the situation uh, we have in the European Union, always in consent, in dialogue uh, with the others. And um, purely legally, we are super sovereign, but in fact, we have to consider very many things and uh, we are trying to get on with this. This is how life is. You can never say the ideal would be that and I lived up to the paradise on earth and there is no paradise on earth. We have to get on and this means that we have to get on uh, with interests of others and we have to consider these interests, make compromises. We should also utter our own interests. This is what I try to do here and uh, our own perspectives and then get into discussions and try to find something that is a good outcome for all of us. Because finally, I would say the Europeans will have to stand to certain um, challenges on the global level in the future. And um, we can only do it together. If we fight each other, if we don't stop quarreling among each other, uh, we will not have the power to stand the challenges that are coming up to us. And I hope 
that we all see that. I hope that the Germans in their minor ma majority see it like that. I hope that the other nations around us in their majority see it so that their governments um, are under a certain pressure to cooperate to the common best on, a, on the basis of an open discussion and then a positive or fruitful constructive enterprise, uh, uh, um, a compromise, hopefully. Yeah, thank you. Very much. Thank you.